Am I on now? That sounds better. Amen. Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. We're going to start a brand new series this morning. I am so excited about this thought and these messages. And um, I'm going to go ahead and tell you up front, I got a lot of material to cover, a lot of ground to cover. I'm going to just throw Bible verses at you just as fast as I possibly can, all right? You don't have to turn to all of them. We're going to be in this chapter right here, the whole message, but we're going to be referring to the New Testament a lot. You don't have to turn. I'm not going to give you an opportunity to turn there. I will tell you this, all the notes, all of my notes, everything that I bring to the pulpit is on the church website, all right? If you follow the links, you can find the outlines about 30 minutes to an hour after church. And uh, so don't, don't kill yourself trying to write all this down. You'll get writer's cramp. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that up front. This series right here is chocked, chocked full of Bible, okay? Can you handle that? I know you came to hear the Word of God this morning. But in Genesis chapter number 37, the Bible says in verse number 2, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto the, his father their evil report. Verse 3, now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. Lord, help us this morning, I pray, as we turn our hearts and our minds to the Word of God. Speak to us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. So one of the greatest types of the Lord Jesus Christ that you will find in your Bible in the Old Testament is found in the story of Joseph. Now, as you know, types are not 100% perfect, but the pictures and the shadows that we find in the life of Joseph are incredible in the way that they depict the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, everybody knows that Joseph had a coat of many colors, the verse that we just read. Everybody's familiar with that. What many people do not know is that Joseph had several coats, four that we know of. I want to preach for the next few Sunday mornings on the coats of Joseph. The typologies that we are going to see that compare the life of Joseph to the life of the Lord Jesus Christ are astounding, especially when we look at these four coats. Each of these four coats in the life of Joseph represent the Lord Jesus Christ in an entirely different light. In fact, the representations of the Lord in these four different passages have an absolutely uncanny resemblance to the four distinct ways that the Lord Jesus Christ is represented in each of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we're going to look at these four coats in a great detail over the next few weeks. You're not going to want to miss a single one of these messages, I can tell you that. But to kick it off, I've got to show you up front what we're going to be looking at. In our text in Genesis 27 and verse number 3, we see the coat of the sun, a picture of Christ as described in the Gospel of John. In Genesis chapter 39, we find with the story of Potiphar's wife in chapter 39 verse number 12, where she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. We see the coat of the servant. This is a picture of Christ as described in the gospel of Mark. In chapter 41, we find Joseph is about to come out of the prison and interpret the dreams for Pharaoh. And the Bible says in chapter 41, verse 14, that Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon and he shaved himself and changed his raiment. This is a, the coat of the sinner. Though he was not guilty, he was in prison falsely accused for a sin he did not commit. Is everybody still with me? This is a picture of Christ as described in the Gospel of Luke where Luke describes Jesus as the Son of Man. 
And then in Genesis chapter 41, in verse number 42, Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand, put it upon Joseph's hand, and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck. This is the coat of the sovereign, a picture of Christ as described in the gospel of Matthew where we find Jesus as the king. I'm going to be honest with you. Just as the four gospels all depict the Lord Jesus Christ in a different way, in a unique way, in a specific way, so do these four different coats of Joseph. In fact, the four coats are all referred to in a completely different way. In fact, in Genesis 37, 3, it's called the coat of many colors. In Genesis 39, 12, she caught him by his garment. In chapter 41, verse 14, they brought him out of the dungeon and he changed his raiment. In Genesis 41, 42, the Bible says he was arrayed in vestures. There's a different word used to describe the coats of Joseph and every single one of these are so rich in typology that it will take us four Sunday mornings to get it all. Is everybody still with me? The significance of these four words for his clothes and the correlation to each one of these four gospels to me is astounding. And as I begin to study, my love for the word of God grew. My appreciation for the Old Testament character of Joseph grew. And my love for the Lord Jesus Christ and his life and his death also began to grow. This morning, we are going to begin with part one and we're going to look at the coat of the sun. In the Gospel of John, we see the Lord Jesus Christ is described as the Son of God. If you wanted to look at the four Gospels, in Matthew, he's the king. In Mark, he's the servant. In Luke, he's the son of man. And in John, he's the son of God. And I think that it is interesting that in the Gospel of John, the book starts out in chapter number one. Verse 34, John said, And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. And the last verse of the Gospel of John in John 20, 31 says, But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And so the Gospel of John shows Jesus as the Son of God. And this coat that we're going to look at this morning, we're calling it the coat of the Son. The first thing I want you to notice is the type of Christ relationship that we see with this coat of the Son in our text in chapter 37. Just keep your Bible open to chapter 37. We're going to cross-reference a lot, but I want you to stay right there in Genesis chapter 37. There's first thing that is clearly seen in this coat in chapter 37, verse number three, is that it was a direct result of a very special relationship between Joseph and his father. This coat was given to Joseph for a very specific reason. Verse three, now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. So this type is, this, this, this coat that we're looking at this morning is a type of Christ's relationship. Three things I want to notice about this. First of all, the coat was deliberate in its declaration. The Bible's very clear that he made this coat in verse number three because the Bible says, now Israel loved Joseph more because he was the son of his old age. At least twice in the gospels, God made a point to declare his pleasure in the preeminence of his son, Jesus Christ. One was in Matthew chapter three, verse 16 and 17, at the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you remember, when John the Baptist baptized Jesus, the Bible says in Matthew three sixteen, Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. And then again, in Matthew chapter 17, verse number five, we find them on top of the Mount of Transfiguration. If you remember, Jesus took uh, Peter, James, and John up there, and Jesus is having a conversation with Moses and Elijah and was transfigured before them. Also, on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Bible says that God, in verse number five, says, while he yet spake, behold, a great bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. 
And so this picture of this coat being given to Joseph by his father because he loved him and because he loved him more, the Bible says, and that typology of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because over and over in the scriptures, those of us that are saved are called the sons of God. Amen. In John chapter one, verse number 12, but as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God. In Romans chapter eight, verse number 14, for as many are, are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. In other places as well, the believer is called the sons of God, but there's only one begotten son and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that in John chapter three, verse number 16. So make no mistake, there was an unparalleled love between God the Father and God the Son, and if you want to get an insight into that, read John chapter 17 when you get home. There was something special about the love that God had for Jesus, just as Joseph and his father had a very special relationship. But not only was that code deliberate in its declaration, but secondly, it was different in its design. The Bible says he made him a coat, verse three, of many colors. The diversity of the design is so significant in the typology of Christ because this coat was one of a kind. <laughs> it was unique. It was unprecedented and it was unparalleled, amen. I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ was the earthly manifestation of the Godhead. Are y'all still with me? He was a one of a kind, amen. I mean, there's never been one like him and there will never be another one like him, amen. The Bible tells us that he exists in the past, the present, and in the future. Jesus said in Revelation chapter one, verse number eight, I am alpha and omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. There's never been anyone like the Lord Jesus. This coat that was given to Joseph was different in its design, but then thirdly, it was distinct in its depiction. The fact that this coat that was given to Joseph was made of many colors is very significant in its typology for a host of reasons. I'm just gonna give you a few of them this morning. The many colors that this coat represents is a picture, first of all, of his promises. The first example that we have of anything in the Bible that had many colors was the rainbow that God gave after the flood. Remember that? The Bible says, I'll put my bow in the sky and this is a promise that I will never destroy the world again. And so the first time that we find any example of many colors in the Bible is Genesis 9, verse number 13, a token of a covenant between me and the earth, God said. Well, I thought about what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter one and verse number uh, two. He said, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ according as his divine power hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue whereby are giving unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. So this Code of many colors is a type and a picture of the many promises of God that we have as believers. But not only do the colors a picture of his promises, but secondly, the many colors are a picture of his priesthood. And you study the tabernacle and, 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 the, and the instructions that God gave Moses on the top of Mount Sinai for how the tabernacle was to be constructed. There are a number of times in this construction where we find emphasis placed on many colors. For example, the door of the tabernacle uh, was of many colors. This is a type of Christ as our only access to God, amen. Amen. In Exodus chapter uh, number 26, verse 36, thou shalt make an hanging for the door of the tent of blue and of purple and scarlet and fine twine linen wrought with needlework. And so the type of the Lord Jesus Christ as the door of the tabernacle was of many colors. The hangings and the curtains of the tabernacle were also of many colors. Exodus 26, 1. This is a type of Christ as our protection and as our shield from the world. Moreover, thou shalt make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twine linen and blue and purple and scarlet and with cherubims of cunning work shalt thou make them. So the picture of the priesthood, you got the door of the tabernacle, the curtains and the hanging of the tabernacle, the veil that hung in the tabernacle between the holy place and the most holy place is a type of Christ as our mediator. It was also made 
of many colors. Exodus 26, verse 30 and 31. Thou shalt rip the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof, which was showed thee in the mount. Thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twine linen of cunning work. With cherubims shall it be made. So the typologies of the Lord Jesus Christ in the tabernacle are amazing. Even the very priests, his, his ephod, and his girdle was made of many colors. And this is a type of Christ as our intercessor in Exodus 28, verse number five and six. Thou shalt take gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen, and they shall make the ephod of gold and of blue and of purple and of scarlet and fine twine linen with cunning work. In Exodus 39, verse number 29, a girdle of fine twine linen of blue and purple and scarlet of needlework. So you see all these many colors and all the many representations in the Old Testament tabernacle is a type and a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and his priesthood. Amen. The significance of this coat of many colors is unbelievable. Thirdly, this coat of many colors was a picture of his purity. In the story of David's daughter Tamar, the Bible tells us in 2 Samuel 13 in verse number 18 and 19 that she had a garment of divers colors upon her. For with such robes were the king's daughters that were virgins appareled. So the many colors was a type and a picture of the promises of God. They were a type and a picture of the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were a depiction of his purity. The significance of this coat of many colors is so rich in its typology. But secondly, not only do we see that it is a type of Christ's relationship, but secondly, we see that it is a type of Christ's rejection. Now watch this. It is crucial for us to realize that in chapter 37 of Genesis, Joseph was not rejected by outsiders and strangers. He was rejected by his own. It was they of his own household. Likewise, the Lord Jesus Christ was rejected by his own people, his own household, often called the house of Israel. In Isaiah 53, verse number three, the Bible says he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid us where our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. In John chapter number one, verse number 11, the Bible says he came unto his own and his own received him not. Zechariah chapter 13, verse number six, we find a messianic prophecy. And one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. The wounds in the hand of Jesus. The wounds in the feet of Jesus where he was nailed to that Roman cross. Those wounds that were pierced in his side from the spear. Those he received at the hands of his own family, his own house. And Joseph was also rejected by his own brethren. The similarities in the rejection of Joseph and Jesus gets even more fascinating when you start to dissect it. Not only were they were both rejected by their own people, their own house, their own family, their own, their own brethren, but they were rejected for the same reasons. First of all, they rejected him because of his purity. In, in our text in chapter 37, the Bible tells us in verse 3 that Joseph brought to his father the evil report of his brethren. Now, we don't know exactly what they were doing. It doesn't tell us. We can speculate, but it wouldn't do any good. We don't know what they were doing, but the Bible says it was evil. Joseph's out there in the field with his brethren watching the father's sheep, and when he got back home, he brought to his father the evil report of his brethren, meaning he was not a partaker of their sins. Huh? And as a result of that, they hated him. They hated Jesus for the same reason. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 22, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Jesus was perfect. Was not a partaker of the sins of his brethren. Are y'all still with me? They rejected him because of his purity. They rejected him because of his preeminence. In chapter 37, the Bible tells us that Joseph had these dreams in verse number five. 
He dreamed a dream. He told it to his brethren. They hated him yet the more. He said to them, yet here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. And behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said unto him, shalt thou indeed reign over us? Shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren. He said, behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. They hated him because of his preeminence. They said, shalt thou reign over us? Shalt thou have dominion over us? You get over to John chapter number five and verse number 18, the Bible says, therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said that God was his father making himself equal with God. They hated him and wanted to kill him because of his preeminence. You get to John 19. In verse 19, Pilate wrote a title, put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. And that's when Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. But they hated him because of his preeminence. Same reason they hated Joseph. They hated him thirdly because of his prophecies. In Genesis 37, verse number eight, the Bible says they hated him yet the more for his dreams, which, by the way, were prophetic. They came true. At the age of 30, the very dreams that he dreamed when he was 17 years old became true. They became a reality. They were prophetic in nature. And the Bible's clear, they hated him yet the more for his dreams. When you get to Matthew chapter number 27 and verse number 63, the Bible says, saying, sir, we remember that the deceiver said, while he was yet alive after three days, I will rise again. They called Jesus a deceiver because he prophesied that after three days he would rise again. They hated him because of his prophecies. In John chapter two, verse 19 and 20, Jesus answered, said unto them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple in building. Wilt thou rear it up in three days? They thought he was talking about the physical temple, the building, the edifice they were standing in. He was talking about the temple of his body. The point I want to make is they hated Jesus for the same reasons that Joseph's brethren hated him. And that was for his prophecies. Fourthly, they rejected him because of his proclamations. The Bible says in chapter 37 of Genesis, verse 8, they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Is that what your Bible says? In Luke chapter 20, verse number 20, the Bible says they watched him, talking about Jesus, they watched him and sent forth spies which should feign themselves just men that they might take hold of his words that so they might deliver him unto the power and authority of the governor. Just as Joseph's brothers hated him for his words. The nation of Israel and the Jews and the scribes and the Pharisees hated Jesus because of his words. In Luke 22, verse number 38, the Bible says all the people came early in the morning to him in the temple for to hear him. What was the results? The Bible says, the Bible says that the scribes and the chief priests sought how they might kill him. They hated Jesus because of his words. They hated Stephen because of his words, did they not? The Bible says they put their hands, stopped up their ears with their hands and ran upon him with one accord and began to gnash on him with their teeth. Joseph's brothers hated him because of his words. Their rejection of Joseph was despicable. The same applies to the rejection of Jesus Christ by the nation of Israel, and it was evident by their animosity. The Bible says in verse four of our text, Genesis 37, that his brethren could not speak peaceably unto him. You see the animosity that they had in their heart towards Joseph. The thing, same thing could be said about the nation of Israel during the ministry of Christ and how that they could not speak peaceably unto the Lord Jesus Christ. It was evident by their animosity. It was evident by their arrogance in verse 20. They said, we shall see what will become of his dreams. Let's, let's sell him 
and see what happens. Let's see if his dreams come true. It was exactly what the Jews did to the Lord Jesus Christ when they mocked him. Luke 22 says that in verse 63, the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him saying, saying prophesy who is that that smote thee? And with many other things blasphemy, they spake against him. We see the same mocking towards Joseph that they did towards Jesus. It was evident by their animosity. It was evident by their arrogance. It was evident by their attacks. In our text in Genesis 37 and in verse number 23, the Bible says it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. Do you see that? It's the only time you find the word stripped in the Bible. S-T-R-I-P-T. It literally means to invade, to make a dash, and to raid and to strip off. That's what they did. They ran upon him with they just they they grabbed him, they ripped that coat, they stripped him of his coat. Is literally what the Bible says. I think it's fascinating that in Matthew chapter 27. And verse 27 and 28, talking about the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. They stripped his coat off of him, just like Joseph's brethren. Does anybody beside me find this fascinating? Thirdly, I want you to notice this coat of many colors, the coat of the sun is a type of Christ's redemption. Oh my goodness. The typology in this coat. The typology in Genesis 37 to what Jesus did for us is unbelievable. I'm going to give you six sub points I want you to notice. First of all, the plotting of the schemers. In our text in Genesis chapter 37 and verse number 20, the Bible says, the brethren said, come now therefore and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say some evil beast hath devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. And begin to scheme. They got together and began to come up with a plan to get rid of Joseph. They hated him so bad. They were so bothered by his purity. They were so bothered by the favoritism that was shown to him by his father. They were so envious of that relationship. They were so, they were so bothered by his prophecies and by his words and they were so bothered by his life that their only response was to put him to death and get rid of him. So they got together and they began to plot and scheme and connive and how they could do that. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 26, verse number three, then assembled together the chief priest and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. The plotting of the schemers. But then you notice, secondly, the price of the silver. The Bible tells us in verse number 28, they're passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. You get to Matthew chapter 26 and verse number 14 and 15. Then one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot went into the chief priests and said unto them, what will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. The typology is unbelievable. You think about this. Judas Iscariot sold the son of God for what you could fit in one hand. 30 pieces of silver. I imagine if you held it right, you could get it in your hand. I know you could if it was in a little bag. 
30 pieces of silver, he exchanged God in the flesh. The one that could perform miracles, the one that could feed the multitudes, the one that could raise the dead, sold him. Joseph's brethren sold him for 20 pieces of silver. Thirdly, don't you notice the presentation of the substitute? Well, I didn't read the whole chapter. I'm assuming that you know the story of Joseph. I didn't have the time to read the whole 36 verses. It's just an amazing story. I've preached the life of Joseph many times. I've preached many messages just from this one chapter. There's so much in there. By the way, Joseph is only one of two characters that you will find in the Old Testament that God never has anything bad to say about. The other one's Daniel. The Bible never gives us one Word of condemnation. He wasn't perfect, but the Bible never sheds light on one sin that Joseph ever committed. Isn't that fascinating? The typologies of the Lord Jesus Christ. But they took Joseph, put him in a pit. They brought him up out of the pit, sold him to the, they sold him to the, to the caravan. The Bible says, the Midianite merchantman in verse 28. And the Bible says in verse 31, that coat that they had stripped off of him, the coat that his father gave him of many colors. They, verse 31, so they took Joseph's coat, killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, this have we found, no, not whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it and said, it's my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. Let's just look at this for just a second. The typology in this right here to me is mind boggling. Because this coat of Joseph, this picture of Christ, the, the, the relationship that the father had with the son, this coat of the son was literally dipped in blood and presented to the father as proof of his death. But just as Jesus was a substitutionary death on the cross and took our place, this innocent animal was killed as a substitute for Joseph. The blood of the substitute presented to the Father as proof that the Son was dead. Are y'all still with me this morning? In Hebrews chapter number nine and verse number 12, the Bible says, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered at once of the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. We call it the doctrine of the substitutionary atonement. When Jesus died on the cross, he took our place on the cross. He died in our place. And when he took that blood, the Bible tells us in Hebrews, back up to heaven and presented to the Father, and that blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat in heaven that was the blood of the substitute. Joseph's coat was dipped in the blood of an innocent animal that was killed as a substitute. They would have loved for that blood to have been Joseph's, but it wasn't. <laughs> and in their mind, Joseph was dead and gone. And their father, in his mind, Joseph was dead and gone. But Joseph wasn't dead. Amen. And when they nailed Jesus to the cross and he shed his blood, the devil laughed and the world laughed and they mocked and they said, he's dead and gone. But he was not dead and he was not gone. Physically, he was dead. Three days later, he came back from the dead. <laughs> I love it. Even more fascinating. Is everybody still with me? Even more fascinating, three times in chapter 37 of Genesis, three distinct uses of the word rent is found in this portion of the story. In verse number 29, when Joseph, when Reuben returned to the pit and said, and said, behold, Joseph was not in the pit. He rent his clothes. That's the first time. Then you get to verse 33. 
And he said, it is my son's coat, an evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And in verse number 34, and Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. Three times in the story, we find the use of the word rent. Three times the word rent is used and all three times something different is being rent. You get over to the story of the crucifixion. We find the word rent used three times, very specifically, three different things were rent. In Matthew 26, 65, the priest's garments were rent. Then the high priest rent his clothes. In Matthew 27, verse 51, the veil in the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And in the end of verse number 51, the earth did quake and the rocks rent. In the story of Joseph, we find three rendings, three specific, unique rendings. And in the story of Jesus, we find three distinct rendings. Is everybody still with me? Unbelievable. Parallels are astonishing. But not only do we see the type and the picture of the redemption and the presentation of the substitute, but we find it in the pain of the sacrifice. The Bible says they presented this to the father of Joseph. Verse number 33, he knew it. He knew the coat, recognized the coat, and said, it is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all of his sons and all of his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, for I will go down into the grave into my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And I thought, just as the death of Joseph or the, the, the blood that was shown and that death that was being presented to the father as the death of Joseph caused his father's heart to break, caused him to mourn. I thought about when Jesus was hanging on the cross. The Bible says that God turned his back on his own son. And Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me to see the sin of all the world placed upon his son? Jesus couldn't take it. The father couldn't take it. The father couldn't even look at it. The pain of the father at the sacrifice. But lastly, I want you to notice the plan of the sovereign. See, Joseph wasn't dead. God had a plan for Joseph. God had something big in store for Joseph. Joseph told it to his brethren many years later, many years later in Genesis chapter 50, verse number 20. Turn over there, I want to show you this. This is what Joseph said to his brethren, the ones that hated him for his dreams, the ones that hated him for his words, the ones that plotted and schemed to figure out how they was gonna kill him, the ones that threw him in a pit, the ones that stripped him of his coat of many colors, the ones that sold him to the Midianite merchantmen for 20 pieces of silver, the ones that it was their fault that he was put into a servitude and slavery in Potiphar's house and ended up ultimately spending years in prison for something that he did not do. Here's what he said to them in Genesis chapter 50. And verse number 20, he said, but as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for good Amen. to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Little did his brethren know that many years later there would be a, a famine that would cause the whole world to be in starvation. The Bible says the, 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 the famine encompassed the whole world. And they all had to come to Egypt for food. Because remember the dream that, they, that, that, that Joseph interpreted for, for Pharaoh was, we, there's gonna be seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. We need to build some storehouses. We need to collect food. We need to prepare for this famine. And the Bible says that everybody came from all over the world to get food from Egypt. Or from Joseph, who was the prime minister by then. Here's what I find fascinating. Joseph's brethren had a plan to get rid of Joseph. They sold him, are you ready for this? They sold him to a group of, of merchantmen. I 
Bible says, they, they, you got to see this. In verse number 30, 25, they looked and beheld a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh going to carry it down to Egypt. Are y'all getting ahead of me? Is anybody else in here fascinated that, that their plan was to get rid of Joseph, but what they ended up doing was putting him with a group of people bearing the balm of Gilead headed to Egypt, stay with me now, and they sold him and they killed him not realizing that God had a plan and the plan involved Jesus bringing the balm of Gilead to those in spiritual Egypt so that they could one day, he could one day save the whole world from starvation and hunger. Come on, y'all. Just as God had a plan for Joseph, God had a plan for Jesus. And in spite of everything that they did to destroy him, everything went right according to the plan of God because the plan of salvation was conceived in the mind of God. The Bible says before the foundations of the world, Jesus was slain on the cross. That wasn't plan B. Jesus died on the cross wasn't, wasn't plan B. Oh, the nation of Israel rejected him. I guess we need to come up with another plan. No, the Bible says he was slain. He was a lamb slain before the foundations of the world. As my daddy used to say, before the mud seals of this world was ever laid, Jesus was already dying on the cross for the sins of all mankind in the mind of God. God had a plan for Joseph, just like God had a plan for Jesus. The coat of many colors, the coat of Joseph, the coat of the sun. You might be here this morning and you have not been one of those people that have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. That means you're with that crowd that's rejecting him. You're with that group of people that fails to see him for who he really is. Just as Joseph's brethren could not see it, just as Joseph's brethren could not accept the fact that God had a purpose and a plan and that Joseph was somebody different, the world still is yet to understand that Jesus Christ was sent by God the Father to be our propitiation for our sin and not our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. He bled and died on a cross some 2,000 years ago so that you could be saved. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, I beg you to get saved. Don't reject the precious Son of God. With heads bowed and eyes closed, we stand to our feet all over the building. There may be someone here this morning that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. You cannot remember a time that you ever got saved. You cannot remember a time that you ever prayed and asked the Lord to forgive you of all your sins and put your faith and trust in Him and the finished work of Calvary. You could do that today. Would there be someone here this morning say, Pastor Shiflet, I'm not sure if I died right now, I'd go to heaven. I hope I would. I think I would. I mean, nobody wants to go to hell, do they? But I don't know for sure that I've ever been saved and I would like for you to pray for me if you're here this morning and God is knocking on your heart's door, would you be honest enough, would you be concerned enough about your soul to just slip your hand up where I can see it? So, preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure if I died right now, I'd go to heaven. Pray for me. Anybody, anywhere? Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure. Anybody, anywhere? I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure if I died right now, I'd go to heaven. Pray for me. Anybody, anywhere? We don't want to overlook you. 